welcome to Unapologetically Sensitive, where you can learn, relate, laugh, and maybe even live a bolder, brighter life. I'm your host, Patricia Young, licensed clinical social worker. This is a weekly podcast where we explore the strengths we have because of our sensitivity and some of the challenges it poses as well. The information in this podcast is not a substitute for help from a licensed mental health professional. Hey there, to the creatives, healers, sensitives, and deep thinkers. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of Creativity and Feeling Like an Outsider with Grace Chan. This is, I feel like I say this every single time, but this is really a great episode. And some of the things that Grace and I talk about are the relationship that she has with animals. She is a commercial photographer, and you'll hear a little bit more about her. But she gets these amazing shots because of the relationship that she has with animals. And we talk about creativity. She talks about encouraging people to tap into their own creativity and that everybody has unique gifts. And so she really wants everybody to share their gifts. We talk about having a scarcity versus an abundance mindset. What is creativity? Is everyone creative? We also talk about the different ways that creativity shows up and people may not identify the ways that they're expressing their creativity as being creative. And so I think this really just puts a whole new spin on things. Grace's parents came to the United States from South Korea. And so she talks about what it was like straddling two cultures and always feeling like an outsider, feeling invisible at school. And we talk about She is a highly sensitive person, but she didn't know it back then. And so we talk about how being a highly sensitive person and all the other subgroups that she were in could have contributed to that sense of feeling invisible. Grace also talks about how people can tap into their creativity. And we kind of wrap up talking about creativity and parenting. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Grace's bio is is really extensive. So I'm just going to give you the highlights. But if you want to see everything about Grace, you can go to the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com. I mean, it's just amazing all the things that she's accomplished. So Grace Chan is a commercial and editorial animal photographer acclaimed for her highly expressive portraits of animals and authentic photos of people and their pets. Her clients include ad agencies, pet brands, magazines, publishing companies, celebrities, and TV shows. Her work also includes clients like Purina, Milkbone, Fancy Feast, Chelsea Handler, all kinds of stuff. In 2014, her photo series, Zoe and Jasper, featured her son and rescue dog. It went viral around the world with mentions by the Huffington Post, Mashable, Good Morning America, BuzzFeed, The Today Show, and countless mentions by the international media. In 2016, her photo series, Harry, featuring dogs before and after their wildly cute haircuts went viral again, with mentions by the Huffington Post, BuzzFeed, Refinery29, Hello Giggles, Insider, Yahoo, O, The Oprah Magazine, Good Housekeeping. I mean, she got mentions from all around the world. So Grace has two dog photography books, Waggish, Dogs Smiling for Dog Reasons, and Puppy Styled, Japanese Dog Grooming Before and After. Grace lives in Los Angeles with her husband's son and two rescue dogs, Maybe and Zoe. And we've got links if you want to follow up and look at her work. It's absolutely amazing. So I just want to give you all a little bit of a heads up. I'm collaborating with another therapist, and we're going to be creating our own individual online specialty groups for highly sensitive people. It looks like they're going to last about three months. We're going to meet for an hour and a half a week. There is going to be a charge for it, but we're working on all the details right now, and I think you're really going to love what we have to offer, so just stay tuned. And now, on to the show. Hey, Grace, welcome. Hi, Patricia. I'm so happy to be on your show today. I am so excited to have you here, and I'm just letting the listeners know we hear some dogs barking in the background. This is part of what happens when you're a podcaster. You get to go along for the ride. (laughs) So true. (laughs) Gotta roll with the punches. Absolutely. Grace, do you identify as a highly sensitive person? 
I do. It's not a label that I particularly um, call myself like on a regular basis. It's not something that's top of mind. And I, I refer to myself as that. But, you know, I definitely relate to every characteristic of being an HSP. Okay. What do you think of the term highly sensitive person? You know, as a term, I feel like in culture, it's probably something that's quite frankly looked down upon a little bit. Like being sensitive is a bad thing. Like mm-hmm. maybe you're over emotional or you don't know how to react to things. Um, but I think that, you know, that says more about our culture than necessarily what that phrase is. Like we should learn to actually see that being highly sensitive is a gift and not a problem. Sure. And what we had talked about offline was you had taken the test on Dr. Elaine Aaron's website prior to the interview, because it sounds like you weren't really sure if you were a highly sensitive person or not, or identified with the label. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think I, you know, I heard about her book about four to five years ago. And when my friend told me about it, it was like this light bulb moment in my head. It kind of made me realize, wow, this is why I am the way I am. Like I am very sensitive to sound and to just visual things and empathetically and emotionally. I mean, just every sense, I'm very sensitive to it all. And it made a lot of things just make sense for me. I did want to take the test before this interview just to find out exactly how I ranked. And I guess I'm a highly sensitive person. (laughs) (laughs) Was there anything when you were taking the test or since then that has been more in the forefront of your mind that you may not have been thinking about? Not particularly, but I think it just made me more aware of just being conscious of the fact that, yes, I am a highly sensitive person. Like I said, it's a gift. It, it makes life, for me anyway, just so much more rich. I just feel like I notice things more, I feel things more, and it adds so much to my life, not just personally, but professionally. Because as a photographer, I mean, those gifts helped me so much in my career. Yeah, absolutely. Which is a great springboard. You have such an incredible background that I was just hoping that maybe you can tell the listeners a little bit about your background and some of the things that you've been doing, because it's quite impressive. Oh, thank you so much. So I am a commercial and editorial animal photographer. And most people, when I say that, they're like, that's a job? (laughs) Like you take pictures of animals for a living? And so what that means is I take images of animals for advertising agencies, magazines, celebrities, TV shows, greeting card companies, calendar companies. Basically, anytime a company needs an image of animals, they can hire me to do that. And I'm also the author of two dog photography books. I started, actually, my professional career as an art director. So I was working in the ad industry. That is a notoriously difficult job. I don't know if you're familiar with how crazy that world is. Mad Med, I think, is pretty accurate. I couldn't watch that show for a really long time. It's just so much stress and working all the time. I say it's basically like you're a human idea factory and you're expected to churn out work constantly at an insane pace. And just to make myself happy, I started taking headshots of homeless dogs on the weekends just to help them get adopted. And that actually ended up turning into a side hustle business. So I was working full-time at the ad agency, working crazy hours, and then nights and weekends, I'm working on my side hustle. About nine months later, this was in 2008, when we had that great recession, 50% of the ad industry was let go without a job. And nine months later, I went into my boss's office and I said, I'm going to quit to become a pet photographer. Ever since then, I've been an animal photographer. So you must have an incredible connection with animals in order to be as successful as you've been. Yeah, I have loved animals my entire life, ever since childhood. Anytime I could watch anything on TV about animals, I would watch it. I grew up on Saturday mornings watching Jack Hanna's Animal Adventures. I loved his show, and I thought I was going to be a vet. So, you know, I did anything I could to be around animals. I interned at the Philadelphia Zoo. I took a job at the University of Pennsylvania's Emergency Animal Hospital. I mean, I did anything I could to be around animals thinking that that could eventually be my career just because I love them and I definitely have a very deep connection with them. It shows in the work that you do. I mean, it, it just does. And I understand that working with animals can be really, really challenging. Oh, I'm glad it shows in the work. You know, it's funny because people always say working with kids or animals are the hardest thing. 
But I think if you have that connection with a kid or an animal, it's not hard. It's hard if you don't have that connection because then you're just trying to make the animal do things or make the kid do things. And what I've learned is when you have that connection, you're actually working together. I'm never there making an animal do anything for me. We are working together and I fully recognize that I am only getting the shots I'm getting because the animal is willing to work with me. So it's always about a relationship and a connection that I'm building. So like for me personally, I would find, I don't know, shooting a wedding and working with brides far harder than working with animals. Interesting. As you were talking, I was reflecting because I'm a therapist and I talk about therapy a lot. And I'm a parent of kids that now that they're 18, we're really navigating some new things. It was so fascinating to see the parallel process. What I heard you saying, and I mean, you literally said it is, it's really about the relationship that you're going in and having a relationship with these animals or with these kids. And then it really shows in the photographs. And if you went in to just kind of jerk the animals or the kids around to try and get some good pictures, it just doesn't show. So when we really go for that connection with another human being, another animal, that's when the relationship flourishes and And the effect of that is this amazing transformation that if you tried to bypass the relationship, you get nothing. Absolutely. You just nailed it on the head. I think with anything in life, it's that deeper connection that is allowing for something really beautiful and magical and deeper to happen. And I think, you know, if somebody doesn't take the time to do that, it shows in a photo, like you said, you know, when you're, when you're taking even a portrait of a human being, whether it's a kid, you know, say, for example, like a celebrity portrait artist, a a celebrity portrait photographer, the really good ones, they're revealing something about that person that hasn't really been seen before. And how are you doing that? That person, that photographer is creating a connection with that person so that they feel vulnerable enough to show who they really are in front of the camera. And it's really the same exact thing with animal photography. I am allowing that animal to feel safe in my presence because I am meeting them at their level and creating that connection with them so that they can reveal their soul to me. Yeah, I was thinking it's really about the emotion that is evoked in us when we look at art or photography or dance or music that especially as highly sensitive people, because we're so much more responsive to that. It's that emotion picture is a picture. But when like you're saying, if you're able to have a connection, then that emotion comes through. And I think that's what we respond to. It tugs at something in us that we relate that makes us feel. Yeah, it is absolutely about that emotional connection. And for me, as somebody who creates, and now that I have a podcast that I'm encouraging other people to create, I feel the best work that resonates allows people to feel something is when there is a deeper emotional connection. Otherwise, I just feel like the work ends up being flashy with no substance. And especially with something like animal photography, I want you to feel the emotion of that animal and really look at that photo and feel like you're getting a glimpse into that very deep emotional world that I know that they have. Yeah. I realized I didn't say this when I introduced you and I'm sitting here debating like, uh, I could do this in the intro. Now I just feel like I'm talking too much. No, you Anyways. have to just say it now. <laughs> <laughs> I do Anyways. I found you by listening to some podcasts. I can't remember if I found your podcast on a Facebook group, but I love your podcast. And the reason why I asked you to be on is I just love your authenticity and how curious you are and how much I get out of listening to these interviews. But it feels like I'm just having coffee with a friend. So love your podcast. Oh, thank you. That is the (laughs) best compliment. When people say they feel like they're just sitting there and having coffee with a friend, that makes me feel so good because that is really my objective. I always tell my guests when they come on, this is like we're having a talk between friends. You don't have to be anybody but yourself. I don't expect you to sound super smart or super well-spoken. Just be you and let's have fun. And so that's so wonderful that that's being conveyed through the show. Oh yeah, you're rocking it. Oh, thank you. Why don't you just give a pitch for your podcast since we're talking about it? Oh, sure. The podcast is called Creativity School. I just started it in January. I thought it was a good time to get people inspired and motivated. And the whole show is just about encouraging people to tap into their own creativity and get their unique inner greatness out into the world in whatever form that manifests. Because I truly, truly believe that everyone is creative. And that is the heart of the show. Everyone is creative. 
You have unique gifts and let's share them. Yeah, it's an amazing show, y'all. I sometimes wonder, I, I believe in abundance in the universe and that there's enough for everyone. I do sometimes have fleeting thoughts that I'm sending people to all these other podcasts. Are they going to stop listening to mine because they found all these new ones? No you know way. <laughs> no, you're building a tribe. No way. <laughs> you're expanding. I really do believe in that abundance theory. And like, I'm not going to create a scarcity mindset that if I tell anybody about any other podcast, then I may lose listeners. And if I do, that's okay. Like everybody's supposed to find their own way. Exactly. And I love that you're talking about scarcity and abundance because I think that that mindset helps a lot with creativity. You know, I always create from a, a space of abundance and I hope everyone else, especially through listening to the podcast, come to believe that too. We'll need to come back to that. I don't know about you, but I feel like I need to have two hour interviews and usually about the 45 minute mark is when things get really good. <laughs> I'm not Tim Ferriss yet. I'm not going to be doing two hour interviews. Can you talk a little bit about what is creativity and is everyone creative? Everybody absolutely is creative. I believe creativity is just your unique human expression. Or in other words, it is your unique soul expression. It is an expression of you and who you really are. And it's an energy in you that wants to come out in whatever form that may manifest, whether it's a new business, whether it's art, photography, or a cupcake. I don't believe creativity is just art. I think a lot of people put creativity in a box and think it's only movies, photography, writing. I don't believe it's just for the chosen few. I think a lot of people think they aren't creative because they look at somebody like Steve Jobs or Annie Leibovitz and think they're not at that level. For sure, I think there is a spectrum of creativity where the people, like I just mentioned, they're creative freaks, you know, they're creative geniuses, but that doesn't mean that we don't hold our own creative power. I think creativity is just a natural, innate part of being human. We all have it, and it's just a matter of tapping into it and cultivating it. So can we talk about what are some forms of creativity that people may not identify as being creative, but they do all the time and they say like, I'm not really a creative person. I mean, it's as easy as thinking about it as budgeting. Like if you run out of money or you need to move things around, that kind of problem solving is creativity. Figuring out solutions to problems is creativity. It's not, like I said, just art. I think creativity is any sort of innovation and that can come through any sort of daily activity like balancing your checkbook, an auto mechanic figuring out how to fix a car in a way that he didn't do before. My husband is a lawyer and my goodness, he's creative because he's got to problem solve every day and find new solutions to problems that nobody else has been able to solve through, you know, the cases he's working on. I love that definition. And I think it really does broaden. I think also about gardening or our relationship with animals or cooking or sewing or I don't know. I'm always terrible about coming up with examples. But those are those all, are some. yes. Those are everything you just said. Cooking is absolutely creative. I really, I just feel like, can we let go of so much judgment about everything and putting things into boxes and labeling things? And that's why I think for me, the broadest form of creativity is, is just your unique human expression. And that can be expressed through cooking, through sewing, through fixing your car, through being a lawyer. You know, you don't have to be somebody in a quote unquote creative field to be able to express yourself that way. Yeah, I think we really do our kids a disservice when we give the message that art is about making something that's visually, I don't even know what the word is, you know, that art is about drawing or painting as opposed to creativity is really about energy and expression. Mm, exactly. I see a real relationship too between, you know, obviously because I'm a therapist, we talk about feelings a lot and feelings as being energy that just needs to move through us. And I think that there's really a, a way that there's a parallel process with creativity. And when you're creative, your creativity is a way that you move that energy and those feelings through you as well. What do you think? I, I love that you just said that because I was actually thinking about creativity on my walk this morning. I think about it all the time, actually. But I think people approach creativity in different ways. And for a lot of people, creativity is very mental activity. I actually just bought, Time Magazine has a new issue out right now specifically dedicated to the science of creativity. And it's all about research and 
the way your brain works and what's happening in your brain when you come up with that aha moment. And a lot of people, it's not even just talking about it through the lens of science. I think a lot of people talk about creativity just from a very mental, rational space, almost like it's almost intellectualized. And for me, Creativity is absolutely a feeling thing. It is an expression of feeling. It is, an, is it, is, it is an expression of something that is deep within you that, like you said, you are allowing to come forth as if it were an emotion. I love that. When you were a kid growing up in your home, how was creativity viewed? And I'm also wondering if there are any cultural aspects that if you're comfortable sharing with us, listeners need to know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. So I'm Korean-American. And my parents immigrated to the United States in 1970. And back then, they were only allowed to leave the country with $500 in cash and each person carrying one suitcase. And that was it. That was all you had to start a brand new life in a brand new country, not speaking the language. So for them, it was all about building a new life and creating more opportunities, not just for themselves, but for the future family that they would build. So I'm the middle child. I have an older sister and a younger brother, and they were just dedicated to giving us opportunity. And that was through education. They really firmly believed that it is through education that you can build a good life. So they really emphasized school and academics. However, I was always a really artistically creative child. I mean, I was constantly drawing, making things. I was very musically gifted as a kid. For a very long time, they were so encouraging of that. And I'm so thankful for that because anytime they saw me show any interest in something related to art, they gave me more opportunities to do more of it. So I, they put me in art class. They put me in piano class. And I would say from about five until junior high school, I was allowed to be this little artist, you know, in second grade, my teacher said I was like a little author. In eighth grade, I won like the most artistic award. Um, I think it was in fifth grade, the school hung, you know, a drawing that I did. I mean, it was just anytime I could win an accolade with art. It's so funny. Like I, it would just come to me. But by junior high school, that's when, you know, the pre-SATs and all the college prep really started. So they made it very clear by junior high, listen, all these things that you love doing, those are just hobbies. You can't ever make a living doing that. You need to make money. You need to get good grades. So I really got drilled at a very young age that you can never make money doing art or being creative and let's get serious and get good grades, go to an Ivy League school and become a doctor. So from about junior high until college, I studied all the time. I used to pull all-nighters, I think starting probably late junior high school. I got really good grades. I didn't go to an Ivy League school, but I did major in biology. And by college around then, that's when I started realizing, well, if I have to study medicine, at least let it involve animals. Like if I have to do that, I'm going to do it with animals. So that's why I was like, I'm going to be a vet. And creativity really just was a hobby for me throughout all that time. Luckily, I never let that go. So all that time I was studying and getting good grades I was still focusing on my creative hobbies, but they are hobbies. Got it. So did you get the messages that academics preceded art? Where did that message come from? Definitely from my parents. And I don't, I know it was because they had no idea what kind of jobs were out there in terms of creativity. They were really looking at it from a perspective of, what is going to allow our children to be able to build a solid foundation and live a good life in this country? Because my parents came here, my dad was an engineer, my mom was a nurse, and they came here and became dry cleaners. And that was an extremely difficult job. So they worked six days a week, about 70 hours a week. They only had one week a year for vacation. And it was a hard, laborious job. I used to go there in the summer sometimes to help them. It's hot is dirty. It's smelly. It's just a very, very hard job. And so for them, they always said, we just want you to have a professional job. Just be a professional and have a professional job because we don't want you to have to work a job like we have. This is too hard. We want better for you. And they just didn't know what other opportunities were out there. I didn't know, frankly. If I knew when I was growing up that I could be a graphic designer or a photographer and make a good living at it, I would have advocated for myself, but I didn't know either. And so 
I went along that path of medicine because I believe that was really the best way for me to get you know, a good solid foundation in life. And it wasn't until college, late college, when I started realizing, wait a minute, people can make money being creative. I didn't know until then. And what, and my parents had no idea either. So it's not like I blame them. They just, they really didn't know. And I, I also think this is why representation is really important because maybe if I had seen other people who are Asian out there doing things, I could have said, Hey, they're doing it. So can I? Sure. I, I mean, just going back to your folks coming over here with $500 cash in a suitcase, you said that and my heart started to, like I got palpitations, oh. you, know, <laughs> you know, that what I leave with when I just go out for a few hours because I want to be prepared is probably half a suitcase. So the thought of having to move to another country with a suitcase and that small amount of cash, I mean, just the resiliency and your folks having a dream, is just astounding to me. It's a funny story because... They actually had extra clothes they couldn't fit in the suitcase. So my dad wore them all on the plane and he started mm-hmm. sweating. And this, this flight is t- uh, the flight attendant thought he was sick because he was sitting Aww. on the plane sweating. He's, he's like, no, I'm just wearing like five layers of clothes that I couldn't fit in the suitcase. Yeah. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Hmm. That's another episode. <laughs> yeah, no. And, you know, that resilience and grit you're talking about has carried me through finding my own creative journey and forging my own creative path. Yeah, I bet. I bet. it's My mind is just kind of imagining, and I can't even fathom, but just thinking about what I would think that would even be like. And it's uh, it's almost a little overwhelming to just even think about. Yeah, yeah. It's. I think that, you know, being a child of immigrant parents and definitely – experiencing everything that they've gone through firsthand, it has motivated me so much in my life in every way possible, you know, and it has also showed me that you really can do anything with whatever resources you have. And that's also a big message on my show where I like to tell people, don't let not having money or not having resources or opportunities keep you from making the stuff that your soul wants to make, because you can always find a way to make it happen. Yeah. Well, and then I would imagine too, and I don't want to go down this too far because it's taking away from creativity, but it just dropped in for me, that I would imagine that you were living a bicultural existence. And so you're experiencing American culture going to school. Your parents have Korean culture, South Korean did, did you say South Korea? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, your parents having a South Korean culture and wanting, I would imagine, to raise their kids with those values and then having to deal with now we've got two cultures and you getting acculturated and then having to navigate your culture at school and then at home and then your parents probably wanting to keep you in traditional ways. I would imagine that was a lot to navigate. Yeah, I think that that's a a pretty common experience for any child of immigrants growing up, you know, in a country, especially like in the United States, where, yeah, it's almost like you're living a double life. For me, I'm so thankful, actually, that I had that very rich, traditional Korean upbringing. I was very involved in the church community, as were my parents. So from a very young age, I was exposed to all Korean stuff, you know, speaking the language, eating the food, going to church with all Korean people and that whole community. And then, like you said, you know, you go to school and then you have this very uniquely American experience. And I think oftentimes that can lead to people feeling like total outsiders. You don't really belong in either place. Mm -hmm. But I am really thankful that I had that very rich cultural Korean church community because you know, at school, I felt invisible. I really felt so alone. I felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't have any good friends. I really, the best way to put it is I felt invisible. I didn't have a voice. I didn't have the self-confidence. And it was like in that church life, I, I feel like I had a double life because in the church life, I was com- the complete opposite. I was popular. Boys liked me. I dated, <laughs> you know, I was not invisible. So you know, I'm thankful that I was able to straddle both worlds, actually. My guess is, too, that being a highly sensitive person, even though you didn't know it, we're only 20% of the population. So now we've got the cultural division. How, what was the ethnic diversity like at your school? That's a really good question. And I think this actually leads into a lot about perception versus reality. Because in my memory and in my perception, I felt like, it was very not diverse. And really, it wasn't. It, w- it was not very diverse. 
my friend and I started the Asian Awareness Association Club in my senior year just to gather the few Asian Americans that were there into a club so we could celebrate our heritage and be proud of it. But what's funny is when I look back on my yearbook, there's a lot more diversity than I remembered. And I think that just speaks a lot to your perception and your experience. If you feel invisible and you feel like you're an outsider, that's the reality you're going to see. Yes. And, you know, I think it's also about how we fit in. And so you were in a few subgroups of minorities, being Asian American, being a highly sensitive person, even if you didn't know, because we're like I said, only 20% of the population. So we're not going to have that sense of connection with other people. So it's kind of like your pool of who you're going to pull from gets smaller and smaller. And you've got a few different ways that put you in a minority group. Yeah, no, no, that, just my thoughts. No, that's a really deep and insightful thought that I had never thought about. And I think that is why I've always felt like an outsider, even though I had you know, that very rich Korean community where I felt popular and seen, I still felt like an outsider. And I always thought it was because I was tall. Like I'm 5'8", which is very tall for a Korean woman. Mm -hmm. You know, I have like a lower voice. A lot of Korean women are shorter and they're so cute. And I'm not cute. I'm tall. I have a lower voice. So I always felt like an outsider. But I'm sure a lot of that feeling of feeling like an outsider also has to do with the fact that I am a highly sensitive person and there are just less of us. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I always seem to have one best friend, but I just didn't fit in. I, I think I would, I would say the majority of us have stories about how we felt like we didn't fit in. We were outliers. You know, in high school, I was an overweight, pimply faced teenager. I felt so terrible about myself. And it internalized so many messages and really felt like I wasn't very worthy. And I, I think it's more common. We just don't usually talk about it. That is so true. I recently, not that long ago, had that same epiphany where I realized I've always felt like an outsider. I always felt like it didn't fit in. I thought that made me the minority. And I really think it's the majority of people who felt that way. Because if you think about the hierarchy of high school, it's only a very small percentage of people that were actually the really popular ones. Mm -hmm. You know, the rest of us were the people who felt like we didn't fit in belong, which means I think the majority of us out there have the same feelings of to this day as adults feeling unworthy, feeling like we didn't fit in, feeling like we are invisible, feeling like we didn't belong. Yep. Yep. Oh, man, I always feel so torn because like, I want to keep going down this path. And I'm having this like, we have to talk about creativity. (laughs) I mean, we don't have to do anything. But I feel like I want to deliver on what I said I was. So I'm going to steer us back to creativity. And maybe we can circle back to this towards the end if we have time. How's that sound? Sure. So why is creativity important? You know, creativity, as I said, is just a very innate human energy. And if it wants to come out, and you don't let it come out, you're repressing a very natural human expression and urge. And I don't think, I mean, you're a therapist, like repressing anything isn't good, right? You got to let it out. Mm -hmm. Have you read Elizabeth Gilbert's book, Big Magic? I have. I love that book. That's one of my favorite books. And if anybody hasn't read it, she just has, for me, it was such a unique perspective about what creativity is and yeah, I don't even think I can articulate, but it runs parallel to what you're saying. I guess I'm saying, read the book. <laughs> yeah, it's like, you know, I, I need to reread it. I read it when it first came out. I think it was almost four years ago now. So now that I have this show, I'm like, I really need to go back and reread it. I think that's very interesting. Yeah, it's a great book. How can people tap into their creativity? Or if they're listening and they've always thought like, oh, I'm not very creative. And so now maybe they're going, well, maybe my cooking or my gardening or my auto mechanics. I think problem solving too. Like I love using my brain. I remember studying for the GRE for graduate school and the logics part was not counted as part of what we needed to get into grad school, but it was my favorite. And I think when our brain is engaged, and I think for many of us that are deep thinkers and deep feelers, we love using our brain and problem solving is really kind of exciting. Mm-hmm. It is. Coming up with solutions in new ways is very exciting. And that's creativity. Yeah. And I think a lot of that comes up with parenting, as exhausting as it can be. It means having to figure out ways to work with your kids so that you can get something done without having a power struggle. That takes creativity. Oh, my gosh. Yes, completely. You can't make a kid. I mean, 
there are different ways of parenting, right? But the parenting style that we want to do, which is actually very different from, say, Korean parenting, traditional Korean parenting or traditional Asian style parenting, that style of parenting is very much like you do as I say, and that's it. End of story. And I'm kind of retraining myself right now. I mean, my son is almost six now. So it's been this process of not parenting in that way, but trying to be more fluid and be more responsive to the person that he is. And that requires, like you said, being very creative in your approach because what works one day certainly does not work the next day. And I have to go with him and what he wants and what he responds to. Right. It's funny. I don't know if I've ever told this story before. When my kids were very young, toddlers, they both have ADHD. I have twins. It was really challenging. They're highly spirited and that's just not how I'm wired. And I remember one day, I don't I don't know what was going on, but I talked about like, you guys just would want to put me in a box and you don't want to tie me up. And like we talked, I kind of created this whole scenario where they had a tremendous amount of power. And then they started to play along of what they would do in it without knowing what I was doing. I was really creating a way for them to use their creativity and imagination and to have a sense of agency and power because as kids, all we do is tell them, put on your shoes, put on your clothes, put mm-hmm. this away, go here, go there. And they had this wild energy that I just didn't know how to deal with it. And this was a way that it really worked. And we created for one of my sons, we called it Daniel's World. And because he, I'm trying to think of a way that doesn't sound judgmental. And I, I, I'm going to be here all day thinking. He was very impulsive and Daniel would want what he wanted. And so we talk about Daniel's world. So if he was wanting something, it's like, let's go to Daniel's world. Mm. And in Daniel's world, he could have whatever he wanted. And so we would use that as a way to really explore whatever it was that he was wanting. And it gave him permission to have those wants and needs. Obviously, he wasn't going to get in this, this world. But it was a way to create a place for that energy to move through him and to make his needs and wants valid. They just didn't necessarily get met in real time. That is a really beautiful example. And it it's so creative because I could have never come up with that. And that's really incredible that you came up with this very beautiful solution that allowed him to feel seen and validated. Thanks. It was something I did. It was not thought out. It was not planned, but it was certainly a way to redirect that energy when he would get angry and frustrated that at least we could create a space where he could imagine what it would be like getting his needs met all the time. I think we all we all want that, huh? Well, honestly, and I think that is the basis of creativity. You asked, how can we start being more creative? It's, it's do the things that you like. What are your needs? What do you want to do? And the problem is, I feel like we do not give ourselves the permission to even do that especially if you're busy, especially if you're a parent, your needs, your wants, your desires, the things that make you happy go to the bottom of the to-do list because everybody comes first. The first way to start tapping into creativity is to allow yourself the space and the permission to do the things that you like and do the things that make you feel good. And it doesn't have to be hours. It doesn't have to be an entire day. Maybe it's just starting by honoring that voice in your head that's telling you just go for a walk today put down the phone, go for a walk, or just try doodling. You know, like we have these little voices that tell us the things that we want to do and the things that we want to like, and we tell it to shut up all all the time. And we need to just stop doing that. I think that is the first step to accessing your own creativity. I love that. So creating some time and space and permission to do the things that we might be interested in. How would somebody start even exploring if they just feel like... I don't know. I got nothing for you. What would you suggest? I think that person really just needs to start paying attention more to themselves because there is always something that you like. I mean, it's impossible to live and function in the world and not like something. So you just have to start paying attention. It is an awareness of focusing on yourself. Maybe we're focusing too much on the outer world and we need to focus a little bit more on our inner world. So If you're out running errands, just pay attention to what you like. You know, oh, I really like that coffee cup over there. Oh, I really like the color of that blouse. Oh, I really love how that plant is sticking out and making this weird shadow on the ground. You know, it's really noticing the things that you like and being aware of that. Yeah, I'm wondering too if our childhood holds 
Mm, I'm not even sure what the word is. It, you know, if we go back to when we were kids and think about the things that interested us or captivated us, if our childhood holds some answers as to where our creativity or our interests lie, what do you think? I absolutely think, you know, yes, absolutely. I think that a lot of us hold back on our creativity because of the way we were, tr- we were treated as children about it. So we shut this very rich part or part of ourselves down because maybe there was a grown up that didn't value it, or maybe there was a grown up that put us down for it, or a grown up that told us we're doing it wrong. And all those things. I mean, children are so innately creative. We are born creative. This is how I know that creativity is within all of us because we are all born creative and it's through conditioning in the world especially through school and just our encounters with grownups who are, you know, usually very well-meaning, it starts really shutting us down. And so I think if, yeah, you can start going back to your childhood and realizing or trying to remember the things that you liked. And that's often, that that's why on my show, the first question that I start out with is, what did you want to be when you grew up? Because I think there's absolutely a connection there because you're getting to the root of the things that interested you as a child. And I guarantee that there's still a seed of that somewhere inside of you. Mm -hmm. And what did you want to be when you grew up? I just wanted to do something with animals. When I look back, everything I wanted to do had to do with, you know, I thought I wanted to be a zoologist. I thought I wanted to be a marine biologist. I thought I wanted to work in the jungle with animals, you know, and then I was like, well, I'm going to be a vet because that's the most realistic thing, but definitely something to do with animals. And I am so grateful that I have ended up working with animals, doing what I love. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I wanted to be a talk show host or a dancer <laughs> or I wanted to write a book, but I wanted to be seen for who I was, not for being an actor. And it's really fascinating to me that I think just that sense of not feeling like I was really seen and honored for who I was, and that I wanted, that's really what my craving was as a child was I just wanted people to see me and to know who I was and me to just be able to show up as I was, and that would be enough. Wow. And you're doing that with the podcast. I know, I know. You and I had talked about this prior to recording about what podcasting, how it's changed our lives. Is that something you want to talk a little bit about? Sure. Yeah. You know, I've been an animal photographer for 11 years now. And one of the things I loved about photography was that it wasn't about me. It was about the work. I could put the work forward and I could hide my face behind the work. And I think it's pretty common with photographers. Most people don't like being in front of the lens. And I was quite happy just allowing my work to speak for myself. But the more I did my own inner work, you know, I'm very, very spiritual. I meditate and I journal and I'm very, very in touch with my very rich inner world. And the more I did that and the more I really became more confident in myself. I realized like, I don't want to be that invisible person that I was in high school anymore. I have a very strong voice that I want to start using. And I think that that's when I started realizing podcasting was a really powerful medium for doing that. And it scared the shit out of me because even though I wanted to do that, that didn't mean that it was easy to do that. And I did it anyway. I worked through, through the fear And I had a lot of fears. I mean, honestly, I think podcasting when I started two months ago was one of the most terrifying things that I could have done. And I did it. And I think what's really cool about conquering your fears is that after you do it, it's just not even scary anymore. Like I can barely almost remember the feeling now about how scary that was. And to me, that is so transformational to think that just in two months, I can barely even remember now how how scary that was. And it feels so incredibly liberating. I totally relate to that. My first episode, I actually started recording, doing recordings before I even launched about the fears that were coming up because I knew that once I launched, I wouldn't remember. It's like childbirth. It's you know awful when you go through it and then you turn around and have another baby. If, if you have babies and that resonates with you for the guys, I'm sorry, I don't have a good analogy for you. Yeah. So what has changed for you having those fears and then launching? It sounds like you're not having those fears anymore. What are you finding about your voice and your perspective and how you're kind of growing into yourself? 
I had total imposter syndrome when I before I launched the show. I feel like how many shows are out there about creativity? How many shows are out there about living your best life? Like, what am I, like another Oprah wannabe? Like, why am I even qualified to do this? Who's going to listen to me? I had all these really negative voices swirling around in my head. And actually doing the show, and I'm only 10 episodes in, I'm like, wow, I actually have a very unique perspective. I couldn't see that before I actually went and did the work. And I have a unique philosophy about this. I am good at having these conversations with people. Like I didn't even, just all these things I didn't even know I was capable of doing to think you couldn't do something and then do it and actually find out that, hey, you're actually good at it. That's powerful. And I never would have known that if I hadn't started. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that I love that Elizabeth Gilbert says when we talk about creativity, because it's common for us to say like, everything's been done, there is nothing new. And what she says is, we bring our own unique perspective to it. And nobody has ever done or created from our perspective. And that's where the uniqueness is, which is that, which is exactly what you're saying. Yes, exactly. I think that what I realized that was so scary about doing this show was that the only thing that would make it different is me. And that scared the crap out of me because now I am having to show up as myself. I'm having to present myself. I am the face of the work. I am not now hiding behind a photo. The show is different solely because of me. Like it is me at the forefront of the show. That scared the absolute crap out of me. And as being that person who felt uncomfortable being invisible, but at the same time comfortable because it ends up being safe. It's You're not safe when you're at the forefront anymore. And that scared me and I did it. And that's why I think it has been so transformational and so powerful. And to realize like I have a very unique perspective like everybody else does. And that is what makes this show its own unique thing. Even though there are hundreds of other shows out there on these very same topics. On paper, they might sound exactly the same, but it's not the same because we are all different and we all have our own uniqueness that we add to what we make. And this circles back to what we started with is relationship. When I listened to your podcast, I so appreciated your authenticity and talking about your fears and feeling overwhelmed and loving it. It made you really human. And had I turned on a show that was just about, this is creativity, blah, 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 without that human element of in it, I don't think it would have been as interesting to me. And I think that we're craving to see real people having real struggles, not in a negative way, but we see these highlights on social media about how perfect people's lives are. And I think we're really craving that connection of our humanity, where we struggle, where things are hard, and being able to see people work through that and experience the joy of it. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. When I created this show, sharing my struggles about starting it and being afraid was very intentional because one of the messages I have is I may have come this far in my creative career and have have had all these successes in my professional life, but it's not because I'm special. It's not because I'm some unique being that can do this. It's We all are capable of doing this and we are all just at different stages stages in our journey. And so the reason why I very intentionally wanted to share about my struggles with starting the show, and I'm very transparent about that, is because I want people to realize we can start new scary things together. You know, I'm starting this podcast, even though it scares the crap out of me, and you can start writing, even if it scares you, you can start baking and maybe selling it, even if it scares you. And I really wanted people to realize we can start at the ground up and do it together. Yeah, I think it's easy. Many of us have a narrative of, but I'm not good enough. I'm not talented enough. We compare, we look at other people and we think that somebody else can do it better. I want to go two directions and one kind of contradicts what I'm going to say, but I'm going to say it anyways. One of the things that spurred me, I'm I'm going to recant. It's often easy to look at other people and compare. And there have been many times in my life when I felt inadequate and I've looked around and I've compared and I see that I'm much more ahead of the game than I think that I am. And that's given me the courage to step out and try new things. 
Obviously, it can also work the other way that if we look around and we compare and we are comparing to people that appear to be much more proficient than we are, that may prevent us from stepping out and doing something new. But if you look at a lot of people who are successful, it's because they just did it. And there are some people Mm -hmm. that are very prominent in whatever field you're in that are really getting a lot of traction and have a big following. Some of those folks I look at and I'm like, "Mm, not really my thing. What I see is they have the ability to do what they're doing. They may not excel at it. They're good enough. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but I think sometimes just having the courage to step out and do what's important to us and to continue to do that, and we can find success in it. And not everybody's going to be our people. And so in my example of people that are doing their thing, and maybe in my estimation, it's not what works for me, they're having success and that works for them. You know, that is something we talk about on the show a lot, this idea that the work that we make is not meant for everybody. And I think that when we put work out there and it doesn't resonate with somebody, we take it as such a personal rejection, but it just means it wasn't meant for them. You can not possibly make work that is meant to resonate with everybody. And if you do that, you're going to make something that is a really terrible summer blockbuster. (laughs) You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You create something that is the lowest common denominator that is meant for everybody. And the best work is the work that is authentic to who you are, authentic to your expression, authentic to everything that you want to say and what your story is. And that might not be for everybody and that's okay. And if a lot of people don't like my work and I'm okay with that. And I know that is easier said than done. I know that. I recognize that it has taken me personally a very long time to be able to say that. But like you said, you just have, if you want to share your work, you don't have to, by the way. It is perfectly okay to make work and keep it to yourself. But if you want to make work and share it with people, you have to just start doing it. And I think that's where the key is. And I listened to one of your guests. And when I launched, I did a 30-day podcasting challenge. And one of your guests was talking about producing a piece of art a day for a 30-day period, there's something that's so powerful in that because then the goal is on just producing something and we get off of the, it has to be perfect, I ha- it has to be well thought out. And for me, doing that 30-day podcasting challenge gave me the creativity to explore all kinds of things that I normally wouldn't have because like, well, this is a certain format and I have to follow it. So I think there's really power in creating for the sake of creating or sending a scheduler for a limited amount of time to produce, not with any expectation about what you produce. Yes, which by the way, kudos to you for doing a 30 day podcasting challenge, because that sounds really hard. That's amazing (laughs) that you did that. And yes, I think, like I said, there is a spectrum of creativity. And what I'm finding is that when I talk to highly creative people, a very common trait is they just make the work and put it out. They are not precious about it. They don't overthink it. They don't judge it. There was a guest on my show named Kevin Butler. And he said, when I have idea, I just make it. I have a very low barrier to entry for when I want to make something. And that is something that is very, very common with these people that I talk to that are the highly creative people. And I think we just need to stop being so judgmental and overly picky about ourselves. I had another guest named Esther Loopstra who was on and she teaches creativity workshops and she talks about open mode and closed mode. And open mode is when you are open and your experience as you're creating, you are allowing the stuff to just flow out. You're being intuitive. You're tapped into what you like. You're doing the thing that makes you feel good. Closed mode is the complete opposite of that. It's when you're being very judgmental, when you're being very critical, when you're listening to that inner critic voice in your head. And that is the quickest way to shut your creativity down. So when you want to get started, you have to just make it and make it and make it. Don't be overly judgmental or precious about it and just get it out. And I think that's why, like you said, that 30-day challenge was so rewarding for you. Yeah, I did it right after I launched. I launched on the 29th of October, and it started November 1st. And it was the best thing that I did. It it was really challenging. So thank you for the acknowledgement. I'm thinking about for the therapists that are listening, there's Winnicott who talks about good enough parenting, that all we have to do is show of me good enough parents. And I can see how the parallel is to creativity. You just need to produce something. You just need to get into the process and the discipline. And it's not about waiting until you're inspired. I I think we struggle with perfectionism and thinking that everything has to be exact and overthinking things. And creativity is really about 
flow and creating the space and the discipline so that that flow can move through us and to continue to do that. And that's how we develop our skill is by continuing to just practice. Absolutely, especially when you are starting out. And this is not to say that you can reach a level of mastery. Mastery is now when you are really working on your technical craft. You are crafting your work. You're paying attention to now making the best work possible. But you cannot start out that way. If you start out that way, expecting mastery, which comes with, like Malcolm Gladwell says, it takes 10,000 hours. If you expect 10,000 hours of mastery to come when you're just starting, you're never going to get anywhere. You're going to shut yourself down the minute you start. Yeah, I love that. Grace, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now for our final question. How do we nurture creativity in children? Oh, I love this question because, you know, it's funny as I realized as I was developing my show about creativity, what a parallel journey it is to watching my own son's creativity unfold in him. And you know, he's five, about to turn six in a few months, and he's just now expressing himself through writing. He's drawing a lot more. He's reading. And it's so cool as a parent to watch these creative gifts in him really start to unfold and flourish. And as a parent now, I really acknowledge and validate the things that he's doing I never put him down for something he does. I mean, that's not to say like there isn't constructive criticism, but I think that's constructive criticism. It always starts with, I love the way you did this. That is so amazing how you built that. What if you tried adding this to it rather than being dismissive of what he made? I want him to feel like there is value in the work that he is making. I think that is so important for adults to know. And to remember and to understand that there is value in the work that you're making. And it's not because it's perfect. The stuff he's making is not perfect by whatever standard you want to measure it by. But I value it because he took the time to make it. And I also just really want to focus with him the idea of progress. I want him to understand that it's not about making the perfect thing at the end of the day. It's about the journey he's going through as he's making it. And sometimes he gets really frustrated. If he can't draw something the way he wants, he gets really angry. He'll throw it. um, He'll crumple up the paper. Even with something like Transformers, you know, he's six now, but when he was around four, people were buying him Transformers for like eight or nine-year-old kids because he loves transforming these things. But it was very hard for him to do that. And we would always work through it with him and tell him, I know this is really hard, but let's just keep practicing. And today is the hardest this is ever going to be. Tomorrow, it's going to be a little bit easier. The next day, it's going to be even a little bit easier. And someday, you're going to learn how to do this so well, you're barely even going to remember how hard this was. Doesn't that link back to what we were just talking about, about podcasting? I mean, it's all so parallel. And so, He gets to the day where now he's so good at doing this transformer and we remind him, we say, you are so good at this. You practice so much that now you're so good at doing this transformer. Do you remember how hard it was for you last week? And it's not hard anymore. And that's because you practiced and you worked at it and you wanted to get better at it. And you did. We really want to instill in him. It's not just about the end goal. It's about the work he put into it the progress that he put into it and now celebrating the hard work that he did. And I think that message absolutely is relevant for anybody who wants to get into learning a new thing and express their creativity. We really have to give ourselves that same amount of compassion and grace and space to fail and compassion when things don't go the way we want. Because if we were to look at our five-year-old self learning how to become a photographer or learning how to bake, how would you want someone to speak to our five-year-old self? I wouldn't want someone to shut it down. I would want someone to be encouraging and nurturing and remind them that that level of skill that you desire will come through the progress and through the practicing. And what I love about that is you're giving your child language for the process of what goes on so that he can internalize that language to walk himself 
through challenges as they come up. So going back to the artwork, instead of saying, that's a beautiful picture, you're such a great artist. Looks like you really spent a lot of time with the colors. Tell me about how did you come up with that idea? I really see you're spending a lot of time and effort on that. Or that's really frustrating. It's really hard when you try something new and you can't get it right. And I love how today is hard, tomorrow will be better. Or things like you're really persistent. What I know about you is that when things are hard, you really stick with things until it gets easier. That what you're doing is you're giving your son the language so that he can kind of self-soothe and talk himself through any challenges that come up. And as highly sensitive people, not only do we struggle sometimes with perfectionism, but transitions. Mm -hmm. And so it can be hard to get started on a project. And so again, that language of, I mean, I have to use this on myself, like, it's hard for me to move from one thing to the other. And I know that once I get there, I do really well. And so just trying to find hacks to get myself from here to there. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the gift that you're talking about when you talk about the process, the language that we give our kids. Yes. And I think it's just so important to remember that we do it for ourselves because we don't. I think we talk to ourselves in the worst, meanest voice possible. And it's horrible. And we should be speaking to ourselves as if we were five-year-olds learning something new. Absolutely. Absolutely. I just did two episodes on childhood emotional neglect, CEN. And that's where a lot of that comes from of when we had parents that loved us, but may not have been able to respond to us. I mean, a perfect example would be a a well-meaning parent would talk to your son and go, that's a beautiful picture. You're such a great artist. And then Mm -hmm. when they struggle, they feel like it's not okay to struggle because nobody ever talks about the struggle. They just talk about perfection. So we internalize that feeling of not good enough and we can't name it because our parents loved us, but it's what didn't happen. And so... And what you just described is how I grew up. Yeah, yeah. It's exactly how I grew up. And so I say I grew up being a workaholic, an overachieving workaholic out of the womb. Yeah. Yeah. And I got so much love and value and attention from my parents for all the amazing things I was always doing. And that absolutely translated into adulthood. And I know, you know, that's why I was an overachieving adult. What I really want to teach now, not just to my son, but for the people on my podcast, is that we need to love ourselves despite the work we make because we get so much value in the work we make. And if that work we make doesn't get attention, then we feel really bad about ourselves. And I want us to love ourselves and the work we make regardless of the external validation it receives. And I want my son to know that I love him no matter what, unconditionally, just as much as my parents did. I know they loved me unconditionally, but I tell him with words so he can hear, I love you no matter what you do or what you don't do. I love that. What a what a gift that you're giving your son. You know, I think oh, all kids want to feel like they're going to be loved no matter what. And yeah, great job. Yay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's taken a lot of work. Parenting is hard. It's very hard. And we don't get a manual. No, we don't. <laughs> and I just feel like I'm also just learning a new language because I am changing a generational pattern of parenting in my family. Sure. You know, I, nobody taught me this. Yeah. yeah. Grace, we need to wrap up. So can you tell us what projects you're working on? And please tell us about, I will put everything that you gave me in the show notes, but talk about your books and your Instagram and let people know about all the great things that you've got out there in the world. Oh, sure. You know, I just really look at having a platform as an opportunity to share something with people that offers an opportunity to feel good. And so my Instagram, I just share a lot of my photos and I regram other things where I just want people to have a moment in the day where they feel good. So I have kind of a large following on Instagram, I think because it's just a really cute, safe space to look at something and you're guaranteed to feel good. And I really have that same mindset with the books that I make. I just think it's such a great opportunity to now have a tangible form of something to look at and feel good. So the first book that came out last year in 2017 is called Waggish. And it's a collection of smiling dog images with very funny captions about why the dogs are smiling. And the book I just came out with last October, that one's called Puppy Styled. And it's a before and after photography series of dogs after their Japanese-style dog grooming. So it's a very different style of grooming that we're not used to seeing too much of here in the United States. I started this project two years ago, so 
it's actually become very on trend now, Japanese style dog grooming. And what that does is it really looks at the dog and the haircut is all about bringing out the dog's very unique personality. Western style grooming is more about grooming to breed standard, which means a Yorkie gets a Yorkie haircut, a poodle gets a poodle haircut. But Japanese style dog grooming is all about bringing out that dog's unique personality, which is what I strive to do in my photography anyway. So it's a really fun meld of that. And as far as other projects, you know, the podcast, it's like a full-time job. It's taking up a lot of my time. And once I sort of figure out a better workflow and figure out how to make this a little more sustainable, because it's a lot of work, I really want to start on a new photo series where I'm exploring, I guess you could say, the higher consciousness of dogs Mm. through that work. Hmm. And what's your website? Grace Chon, C-H-O-N dot com. And how about your Instagram? Instagram is at the Grace Chan. Grace Chan was taken, so I had to add a the in front of it. <laughs> and you have quite a big following. I'm a little envious. Oh, oh gosh, that's a whole nother conversation, Patricia. We talk on the show, on my show, a lot about Instagram and talk about, you know, gosh, talk about unworthiness and comparing and all that stuff. It happens with Instagram. I think for me, the healthiest way I've been able to approach it is, as I said, it's a vehicle to share and make people feel good. Yep. I hear you. Grace, thank you so much for being here today. I love this conversation and I think I'd like to ask you to come back another time so we can talk some more because this just had so much good stuff and we just couldn't get to everything. Oh, Patricia, thank you so much for having me on. I feel like I had a couple revelations talking to you today. This has been such an insightful conversation and I would love to come back anytime. Yay, happy dance. (laughs) (laughs) All right, thanks, Grace. Have a great day. Thank you. This was amazing. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening today. I really hope that you got a lot out of this episode. I I love talking about creativity, and I really enjoyed recording this with Grace. If you're enjoying the podcast, please share it with other people. Please go and rate it in iTunes. If you go to the show notes at unapologeticallysensitive.com, I've got links and descriptions. If you happen to listen on your iPhone, you can just scroll down in the app when you pull up Unapologetically Sensitive. You can rate it with the number of stars. You can also go in and and write a review. It just makes it easier for other people to find the episode. And if you're getting value, I really want as many people to find the podcast as possible. If you have any questions or comments, you can email me at unapologeticallysensitive at gmail.com. I love hearing from you. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen. I really appreciate it. Remember, sensitivity is nothing to apologize for. It's our superpower. Have a blessed day. Oh, 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 oh,